Hi, um, so my name's Irina and I'm a current Blue Waters graduate fellow and I'm gonna talk a little bit about my past work this year at the University of Washington with Tom Quinn on adding uh, anisotropically diffusing cosmic rays into ENZO. Um, so in the next 18 or so minutes, I'm gonna give you a brief background to the topic. I'll talk about some of the uh, methods and key challenges that I encountered in my project. I'll mention why Blue Waters is so important for the project, um, show some preliminary results, and touch on the broader impact. Uh, so cosmic rays are charged particles. So protons, electrons, really any ions, but for the sake of modeling them, we're gonna say that they're just protons. And this is observationally motivated, because if you look at, um, at the cosmic ray energy flux as a function of their energy, protons are um, by far uh, the dominant flux that we receive. Um, cosmic rays move at relativistic speeds, and they're accelerated to these relativistic speeds in extreme shocks like supernovae, uh, AGN, quasars, gamma ray bursts. But I have supernovae underlined because um, they're observed to uh, come from supernovae, and um, it's pretty typical for uh, galaxy simulations to have supernova feedback, whereas um, like having AGN is like, you know, extra perks. Um, so if you know, you know the mass of a proton, the energy at which you expect to be, it to be moving, you can do some back of the envelope calculations and figure out you know, the expected mean free path of a cosmic ray streaming freely. And that mean free path, you know, depending on the density of the medium through which it's moving is something like on the order of kiloparsecs to maybe hundreds of megaparsecs, which is really huge considering that the scale height of a disk galaxy like our own is only 300 parsecs. So you might naively expect that you know, once created, cosmic rays jump out of the galaxy and we shouldn't really care about them. But they're observed to have an escape time of roughly 30 million years, which means that there must be some sort of scattering mechanism present that keeps them inside the galaxy and keeps them interacting with the gas of the galaxy. Um, and as it turns out, that scattering mechanism is the magnetic field. So because cosmic rays are charged particles, um, the moment they encounter a magnetic field, they experience a force tangential to the direction of motion, and so they become kind of bound to that magnetic field line, and they stream along it. And galaxies have pretty important magnetic fields. Um, this is a quick video showing um, the magnetic field evolution of an isolated disk galaxy. The color shows magnetic field strength. Um, the left is an edge-on view of the galaxy, and the right is a face-on view of that same galaxy. And the streamlines are um, the topology of the magnetic field. So I'll play that again. Um, so you can see that although there are some large-scale structures in the magnetic field, um, it's very turbulent on small scales. And it's also prevalent, you know, not just inside the disk of the galaxy, but out, um, outside of it in the circumgalactic medium. Um, and it's hard to see the scale, but that actually reaches tens of microgauss in strength, which uh, means it's strong compared to the energy in the kinetic, or the kinetic energy of a galaxy. Um, so what cosmic rays do as they stream along these magnetic field lines is they drive um, instabilities in the magnetic fields, and that creates a cosmic ray-driven dynamo, which is just a generic term saying that kinetic energy is getting converted into magnetic energy. Um, and these outflows, or, and these instabilities also create outflows, which have been shown to be much stronger and more mass-loaded than uh, outflows from thermal feedback alone. And we really care about galactic outflows because they enrich the circumgalactic medium, which is the diffuse multiphase gas that's outside of the main disk of a galaxy, but within its uh, dark matter halo. And then, so that's that red stuff on the plot, and then anything outside of it is the intergalactic medium, or the IGM. And the circumgalactic medium is actually really cool, because it holds most of the galaxies, or most of the baryons in the universe. So if you do um, standard lambda CDM cosmology, you can uh, predict the number of baryons you'd expect to see based on the mass of dark matter we have, and galaxies do not have anywhere near, you know, 
the number of baryons we expect to see because they're um, out in the circumgalactic medium. Uh, the CGM also holds the majority of metals, um, and so even though metals are only created in stars, which primarily happen in the disk of a galaxy, galaxies retain only maybe a quarter of the metals that they create, so it gets um, pushed out into the CGM somehow. And finally, the CGM has a reservoir of cool gas, which is um, required for star formation, and it's also the medium through which uh, cool gas from the IGM flows uh, into the main disk galaxy. And understanding how um, this cool gas is accreted onto the main disk galaxy is really important for understanding galaxy evolution, for you know, why some galaxies continue forming stars while others um, die out relatively early. And so where cosmic rays come into all this is that they drive mass loaded outflows from the galaxy and they provide a non-thermal pressure support that might explain uh, the presence of a warm uh, neutral gas in the CGM that's not in thermal equilibrium with uh, the halo temperature. And so inherently using cosmic rays and simulations predicts um, a, a CGM with a different you know, um, structure and composition than simulations with just uh, thermal feedback. Um, so what does it mean to say, you know, I added cosmic rays into a simulation code? Um, uh, so I used ENZO for my project, which I know there have been a lot of talks using ENZO, but I'll, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, ENZO is an adaptive mesh grid code, so it simulates a fluid moving through uh, cells. And in order to advance the simulation by a time step, um, ENZO solves uh, Euler's equations, which are summarized here. Um, it's basically saying uh, the time change of some conserved quantity in a cell should equal the flux of that quantity through the cell interfaces plus any source terms. And for every time step, ENZO numerically approximates the solution to this equation using one of its several uh, Riemann solvers. And so to go into a little bit more detail, um, the vectors U, F, and S look something like this without cosmic rays, so, and where each row denotes a new um, conserved quantity that we want to keep track of. And when cosmic rays are added, you know, intuitively they get their own row because it's a new uh, fluid that we want to keep track of, but also they exert pressure and are part of the total energy, um, uh, well, they exert pressure on the rest of the gas and that pops up where I boxed it in red. Uh, the green boxes show the diffusion term, which is what dictates how cosmic rays actually move. So kappa is a coefficient of diffusion, and so for a very high value of kappa, the cosmic rays would be slowed down a lot, and with a kappa of zero, they'd just be streaming freely um, at their relativistic speeds. And then you'll also notice that to do proper anisotropic diffusion, um, that their motion depends on the direction of the magnetic field. But instead of staring at equations, I have um, a more intuitive display of what cosmic ray diffusion is. So this is a 2D slice of a uniform density box um, with uh, cosmic ray energy density uh, pictured, and the initial conditions are just a Gaussian over density of cosmic ray uh, energy that's slightly off center. And then there are circular uh, magnetic field lines around the center. And so if you have isotropic diffusion, if you want to say magnetic fields are really expensive to compute, let me just approximate them away. You can um, you know, get, just basically get rid of them, and you have isotropic diffusion, which means that they, the cosmic rays move um, in all directions equally. But if you want to account for how they interact with magnetic fields um, and keep the entire uh, anisotropic diffusion term, you'll see that the same initial conditions uh, start moving around the magnetic field um, as they evolve. Um, and so the key challenge with cosmic rays actually becomes uh, computational time. And there are two ways in which the cosmic rays decrease um, the maximum time, or the time step that you can take. One is through diffusion. Um, which depends on the square of the cell width and the diffusion coefficient, but I found that in my simulations, the limiting time step is actually the current condition, which basically asserts that your time step can't be faster than the speed through which information can travel, um, or you know, the 
effective sound speed. And that effective sound speed um, def uh, is proportional to the square root of the pressure of the cosmic rays and also the pressure of the gas and the magnetic pressure. But I found that once um, the cosmic rays reach like equilibrium pressure or like once they start matching the pressure of the gas in my simulations, the current or the time step doesn't decrease, you know, by a factor of two-ish, like I might expect it decreases by a factor of, you know, 10, sometimes 50. So this has been a major challenge and something that I'm gonna look into in the very near future. And it may very well be that that's just the limitation of, um, of the code. Um, so the key challenge can be summarized into saying, you know, pick two from reasonable computational time, cosmic rays or magnetic fields, and in order to do anisotropic cosmic ray movement, you need the bottom two. Um, so why blue waters? Uh, galaxy simulations have a very wide uh, dynamic range and scale, um, like Tom was mentioning. So, and each of you know, the very refined cells follows a very complicated set of interaction rules. And I mentioned some of them uh, you know, in the previous slides, but I you know, haven't mentioned star formation, um, other kinds of stellar feedback, um, AGN feedback, cooling, following chemistry. So all these things take a lot of computational time. And so it's really necessary to use a machine like Blue Waters um, in order to get these simulations running. Luckily for me, before I ever started this project, many people were already using Enzo on Blue Waters, so it was already ported and optimized to run on Blue Waters. Um, Blue Waters has sufficient data storage, so I can keep the results of my galaxies, which run on the order of terabytes per uh, galaxy per you know, few billion years. Um, and Blue Waters has an awesome support team, which is really dedicated to helping people with their technical problems so we can get more science done faster. Um, now, the fun part uh, is some preliminary results, and I emphasize the word preliminary. I, this is very recent work. I just got this working, so um, for, in the interest of time, I decided to show two um, like isolated disk galaxies that follow the uh, Agora initial condition prescriptions with two changes. One is that they have a blanket uh, background magnetic field of 10 to the negative 16 Gauss, and then one galaxy has a background uniform cosmic ray energy density of 10 to the negative three ergs per gram, um, and one galaxy just has no cosmic ray physics. And so these were evolved for 800 million years, that, and that took about 2,000 core hours. Um, I use such a low value for the cosmic rays because, um, like I mentioned earlier, once the cosmic ray pressure reaches gas pressure, it takes a long time to run, and um, this actually shows uh, the, the results are still meaningful, um, but this is a fast way at showing some uh, results. Um, okay, so in the interest of studying the circumgalactic medium, um, using metallicity is a good way to trace galactic outflows. So metallicity is uh, the measure of the fraction of metals in the gas compared to that in the sun. And for the non-astronomers, I apologize, but we say metal to mean something heavier than hydrogen or helium. Um, so this is um, an edge-on view of uh, a galaxy after three million years. Um, so this is basically initial conditions. Uh, and you'll see that the circumgalactic medium is, um, has a metallicity of a millionth of solar metallicity, and the disk is initialized to a thousandth solar metallicity. And if you let this evolve for 800 million years, uh, we'll start with the galaxy that had no cosmic rays. Um, it shows, you know, signs of some outflows. It looks like there was a supernova event more recent, or in the recent history of uh, this run, um, and you start seeing some um, outflow coming out from the core because it still has pretty active star formation because this is a very young galaxy. But if you look at the um, galaxy that did have a blanket field of cosmic rays, um, you get you know, very different results. And um, so qualitatively, you know, there's, the CGM is much more uh, metal enriched, but we can do better than qualitative results. We can use uh, this new uh, add-on tool for YT called Trident, which lets you take an arbitrary sight line through your simulation and say, you know, which absorption features you wanna look at, you know, add signal to noise ratio, um, add a quasar spectrum, 
in the background, but most importantly, it lets you add instrument-specific um, line spread functions, so you can compare your simulations um, directly to observed data. And so this had a line spread function from the um, Hubble Space Telescope Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, which is um, really doing much of the um, groundbreaking research in uh, the CGM. Um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. So in the previous slide, I conveniently chose a box of 70 uh, kiloparsecs because the galaxy was young and it was you know, nice to make it, the outflows look really big. But really the CGM extends out to the virial radius, which is um, you know, somewhere around there. And so you know, step one for future work would be evolve the galaxies longer, like give them the time to um, enrich the CGM. Um, another thing we'll uh, look at is uh, adding dynamically important cosmic rays. So do supernova feedback that, um, you know, give them maybe 10% of their feedback in cosmic ray energy. Um, we'll look at different mass galaxies and you know, see how dwarfs versus like ultraluminous galaxies are aff affected differently by um, supernova feedback. And also um, look at different diffusion coefficients because uh, they've been, even though there's some observational constraint on that value, you know, changing it by like a factor of two gives pretty uh, different results for the galactic outflows. Um, so the broader impact of this project is that ENZO is a publicly available um, community developed code. So the cosmic ray physics that I added, you know, once I'm done fixing it up will be available for, you know, the ENZO community, and so people will be able to use it with any hydrodynamic or MHD solver for a variety of different problems um, that, you know, stretch beyond the circumgalactic medium of isolated disk galaxies. Um, so in summary, um, understanding the structure and composition of the CGM is really important in understanding galaxy evolution as a whole, and cosmic rays drive uh, mass loaded outflows which change the structure of the CGM and help us understand you know, the physics governing um, that evolution. And in order to be able to properly simulate cosmic ray behavior, we need to use uh, magnetic fields and atmospheric diffusion, but that's computationally expensive. Um, so in future work, we'll, re, you know, we'll add more cosmic ray feedback, we'll run it through, uh, we'll run the simulations with different mass galaxies and environments, and we can observe, or we can compare our simulations by using synthetic spectra generated by Trident and comparing them to observations. Great, uh, thank you.